Tonight on Metro News. More young Kiwis are being diagnosed with bowel cancer. As Ramadan comes to a close, the Muslim community is healing together. And farmers say the zero carbon targets are too tough. Kia ora, good evening. Welcome to your local news brought to you by the students of the New Zealand Broadcasting School. It kills more people than breast and prostate cancer combined. Bowel cancer is a disease which doesn't discriminate, affecting people everywhere. June is Bowel Cancer Awareness Month and I took a look at the rising statistics in New Zealand. Oh, not that way. For Anadu Gray, it's moments like this that keep him going. At 37, he was diagnosed with stage 4 terminal bowel cancer and told the disease had travelled to his liver. It happened really fast for me. So, um, yeah, it was within the week I was, I knew that I had what I had. New Zealand has some of the highest rates in the world for bowel cancer and more younger people are being diagnosed with the disease. Many doctors do seem to still think that it's not something that affects younger people or they look to lots of other factors first and rule out bowel cancer pretty quickly. Diagnosed with bowel cancer at 39, Halliwell says the lack of discussion on these growing figures is alarming. You know, I think bowel cancer isn't talked about anywhere near often enough and that it should just become something that's a conversation that you have with your family, with your friends. I suppose just talking about it first, because it's quite, you know, hard talking about your butt and what's happening with it. This month alone, 250 people will be diagnosed with bowel cancer and 100 will die from the disease. These are figures which health sectors say they're trying to change. However, sitting on your symptoms and not going to the doctors doesn't make things any easier. Often that's where the biggest delay is, is actually getting people to, to seek help. Once they seek it, if they meet the standard criteria, the pathway is usually not too bad. A tutor and father of four, Anadu Gray's message is if you're worried about symptoms like tiredness and rectal bleeding, make sure you get a medical check. Death is pretty fearful in its own self, so yeah, it's better if you have those symptoms and go get it checked out before the symptoms, you know, take your life. Isabel Prasad, Metro News. With winter here, those living on the streets will be feeling it the most, but some volunteers are making the chill a little easier to bear. Grace Thomas has the story and joins us now. Grace. Yes, that's right. Christchurch has a growing homeless problem and its estimate several, estimated several hundred are out on the streets. A number of welfare groups are helping with clothing, accommodation and food. I met with one group doing their bit. You'll find Sisterhood Street Care at Latimer Square every Wednesday, feeding those in need. It's a hard job. Bye! But they do it for love. We're about building them up, we're about having it like a family picnic and the last thing we say before they leave, I always make sure the team say, I love you. And because they've been through hardship themselves. We're all on a benefit of some form, we're all going through homelessness ourselves and got back on track ourselves um, and we all struggle. The team of around 10 work tirelessly, putting together dozens of meals every week. We've got potato bake. <laughs> and we've got chicken, mince and peas. The government is trying to fix the homeless problem. This budget pledging $197 million into extra housing. The Christchurch City Missioner says the funding boost is helpful. We're part of the Housing First Collaborative in Christchurch, and we're in Canterbury, and uh, we know that there's been a, a really positive outcome in respect to housing people who have been chronically homeless. So I think anything that's, that is an investment from the Crown into that space is helpful. But Tina says money isn't enough. People need to get out of the office, get their shoes on, get down here. That's how you're going to fix it. Some hands-on advice from someone who knows. So Grace, do we have any idea what it actually costs to look after someone who's homeless? So I also spoke to a group called Housing First and they estimate it's around $65,000 a year. But when these people are housed, this cost halves. Last year, 150 people were found homes. But as Housing First points out, these wait lists still aren't decreasing. Thanks, Grace. 
Tomorrow is Eid al-Fitr, that's the end of Ramadan for the Muslim community. This is the first Ramadan after the March 15 terror attack. Louise Tanuth went to Masjid al-Nur to see how they're recovering. Nearly three months later, they're back to praying, eating after sundown and healing at their mosque. But it wasn't an easy step to take. Many were concerned about going back. Started off with uncertainty, uh, and people were sort of saying that there were those who were still unnerved, um, not sure, a bit wary of coming to the mosque. But there's one thing that holds them together faith. Nothing will stop Ramadan, whether there's attacks or Ramadan is going to be Ramadan. People, they're going to go. The strong believer, they, everything we, we say that everything belongs to Allah. So if it's my time, whether I'm going to the mosque or whether I'm in the street or wherever I am, I'm going to pass away. So I'd rather go and pass away in the mosque than pass in somewhere else. During Ramadan, Muslims fast during daylight hours, getting together in the evening to eat and pray. Because Ramadan itself is seen as a month of mercy, a month of generosity, a month of giving, then I guess it's all coming together and the best perspective on it is going to come in the course of time. Their grief isn't over, but the community is more united than ever. Hatred is going to change to love. As a whole community, this is what I like. This is the good outcome comes from this 15th March. Ramadan ends tomorrow and Muslims around the country will come together in celebration. A reminder of what once was, but also all that is yet to come. Louise Tanuth, Metro News. There's been a lot of debate and discussion around the fate of the Catholic Cathedral in Barbados Street. Like many old historic buildings, it was badly damaged in the quakes. George Clark is looking into the issue. George, when can we expect a decision? Well, after nine years, it looks like we will know next month. It's been a long-awaited decision. A lot of people have really wanted to see this Class 1 heritage building saved. But the extent of the damage means restoration will be a huge project. St Mary's Pro Cathedral is where organist Don Whelan has been making music since the earthquakes. It's a temporary home and he's looking forward to something more permanent. If they put up a new one, um, I'd like to have some input into what it sounds like. For four decades he was based at the Cathedral of the Blessed Sacrament in Barbados Street, but the future of that building's been in limbo since it was badly damaged in 2011. There are two options for the cathedral. One is um, remain where we are on Debato Street or moved to a more central site in the city. He says overall the cost of repairing the cathedral could be as much as a hundred million dollars. There's mixed feelings. Some people you know, love the old cathedral but there's a recognition that also that maybe a new cathedral will bring new, um, new possibilities being in the central city. In terms of where in the central city, Mike Stopforth is keeping any decision close to his chest. The bishop's exploring purchasing some land in the inner city. I can't say exactly where. But while the church is reluctant to say where, Don Whelan thinks he may know. At the moment he is consulting, talking to people, but his intention, if he can, is to put up a new cathedral in Victoria Square. The site he's talking about is the old Price Waterhouse building opposite the piano, currently fenced off and undeveloped. The bishop's got a real vision for the cathedral, really around it being a vibrant parish. Whether the church goes for the restoration option or a rebuild, It'll be expensive. Never enough to do what all we want to do. So a new cathedral will be partially from insurance, but certainly fundraising will be required to, to do to build whatever the bishop wants to build or restore in the future. And whatever the decision, Don Whelan will be back, providing the music. So according to Mike Stopforth of the Catholic Diocese, next month's decision will be made public. He says if they go for the rebuild, they would need to look for the right earthquake design. Earthquake proof design. Any new construction won't be quick. He says a new rebuild could take up to five years. Thanks George. Coming up, farmers are frustrated with the government's zero carbon bill. And a wild rabbit culling could leave these pets at risk. My name is Alistair Coburn, uh, I'm the station producer for Classic FM. So we're in London, we've got eight radio stations and two TV stations here. So I've been doing this job about two years. Got a phone call while I was in uh, the middle of Europe saying you've got a job interview in London. 
worked out quite well. London's the greatest city on earth, I think. There's so much to do here, it's, it's just such a vibrant place. My first year in the UK, I think we saw about 10 different countries. Two weeks ago, we were in Wales. A week before that, we were in Prague. It's really amazing. I mean, Classic FM, we've got 5.3 million listeners every week. So it's more than the entire New Zealand population. I'll be writing promos, writing trails, writing imaging, writing commercials as well. I got nominated for a Sony Radio Award for a promotional campaign which I worked on. The skills that I've got from, from my study, they really stand up. It taught me a lot about how the entire radio industry works, like from sales to production to on air to writing. Once you're done, you've got the internship, you get straight into a job and from there you're off. I mean, the world's your oyster basically. Welcome back. Domestic rabbit owners are up in arms over a deadly virus being released in the residential red zone. It's being used to control the number of wild rabbits, but there are concerns it will spread. Brooke Hunter joins us now. So Brooke, what's the problem? Well, the issue is there are too many rabbits in the red zone, wild ones that is, and their numbers need to be controlled. But this virus kills all rabbits and is highly contagious, so there is a danger that domestic rabbits could die. Brenna Deacon is frustrated, concerned her rabbits will die as a result of plans to kill off wild ones in the red zone. The disease spreads so quickly and it's one of the most horrific ways for a rabbit to die. Land Information New Zealand manages the residential red zone and will use the K5 strand of the Khaleesi virus to control ballooning rabbit numbers. So this is certainly not something we take lightly, it's not something we would like to do, but given that we are a landowner, we do have responsibilities. It's areas like this the bait will be laid. The virus spreads easily, has no cure, and rabbits die within two days. And we've looked at using this specific virus uh, because it is targeted. Um, it's targeted at the European grey rabbit that was predominantly the wild rabbit that you would see out in the red zone. There's a vaccine to protect domestic rabbits, but Brenna Deacon says it's too expensive. Although she's vaccinated hers, she says many can't afford it. But there are some people out there who have, you know, our students, our single mothers, who struggle to come up with $100 per rabbit. She started a petition to get the vaccine subsidised. I think it's actually really, really important that if they're going to do this, they should at least, you know, make sure that they're looking after our pets. At this rabbit rescue, they'll need more than $2,000 to keep their animals safe. Well, pretty much, I'm pretty much going to be saving up fast and trying to each payday try to see what I can put away to vaccinate my guys. Since the announcement two weeks ago, demand for vaccines has quadrupled. People are concerned because obviously some people live very close to the red zone. Um, a lot of people like to walk in the red zones. So they're worried about bringing the virus back with them. Land Information New Zealand says because the virus has already been around for some years, most domestic rabbits will already be protected but may just need a booster. Brooke, you mentioned a petition. So what are the numbers looking like now? When I checked earlier, the petition had reached almost a thousand signatures. So Bruna's pretty happy with the numbers. Because it's so popular, she's got another petition going on the government's official website. And this one should be presented to parliament later this year. Thanks, Brooke. The Zero Carbon Bill is now open for public submissions after passing its first reading in Parliament. But as Laura Gregg finds out, the bill has left the agriculture sector with a lot of questions. Arable farmer Eric Watson's worried about carbon. Farms like his are being blamed for damaging the environment. The problems, nitrous oxide from soils, methane from livestock and carbon dioxide from machinery. Plan changes in the Zero Carbon Bill to reduce carbon emissions will cost his farming business. Some of these restrictions that the government's imposed upon us are, are quite severe. We really don't know how much carbon we emit, and, and that's the other thing as well. These gases account for half the nation's greenhouse gas emissions, contributing to global warming. Eric's been cropping his whole life and grows wheat, linseed and veggies on a 490 hectare block in mid-Canterbury. He'll need to cut his nitrous oxide pollution to net zero by 2050. We need to be here, so. and if our profitability drops completely, the consumer's going to have to pay a lot more for food to, to overcome the lower yields that we're facing. Methane emissions will also need to be reduced for the zero carbon bill, but the reduction targets of 24 to 47 per cent by 2050 are ones the farmers are not agreeing with. The agricultural sector's united in its opposition, those against it include Federated Farmers, Beef and Lamb, the Deer Industry and Dairy NZ. Now I know uh, why a lot of farmers uh, were confused. The confusion stems from the fact that there are a number of different reports 
but they actually use different baselines. Experts say farmers and farm organisations need to skill up on these complicated issues. Farmers are struggling to communicate their argument and a lot of that is because they don't really understand the complex science. But farmers remain bitterly opposed to the bill, saying their only option is to cut stock numbers and that will eventually lead to consumers paying more for their food. Laura Grigg, Metro News. Canterbury netball team The Tactics had a challenging yet impressive season. Natasha Payne is here with their goal shooter Ellie Bird who made a significant impact this year. Natasha. Thank you Ellie for joining us today. Now how did it feel to be um, promoted from the reserve grade Beco League to the good oil tactics in 2017? Um, well Beco League was a good stepping stone for me because I hadn't played pre well, the year prior to becoming or coming into the Beco League. Um, but yeah, it was it provided me with a skill and like knowledge of the high performance arena, so that stepping up wasn't such a difficult task. So you feel like it, um, it prepared you well, or was the ANZ competition still a wee bit of a shock? Um, yes, it was a bit of a shock, I guess. But when I stepped out on court, I had nothing to lose, so I just you know played and did what I could. Awesome. Um, how do you feel the tactics went this season, considering uh, your team did lose two very uh, influential players to, in, to injuries, um, including Silver Fern, uh, Silver Fern defender Tim Alisi? Well, to be honest, I think I almost cried when I found out that Tim had done her ACL. Um, and also, obviously, losing Ericana was at a like really tough time in the season because we'd just done three months of pre-season training to then lose our mid, one of our main mid-quarters and then, like, dealing with the replacement. We did eventually create the connections with a new player, but um, yeah, it was a tough time at the start of the season. Mm. Do you feel like the team rallied together at, the, at that point to keep each other yeah. strong? We've always had a, like, a good vibe in the team, so we try to stay positive, and you know, we just gotta take any obstacle as it comes to us. Awesome. Um, speaking about defensive players, you've got to train all season with uh, Silver Fern goalkeeper Jane Watson. Did that benefit you in your play? Uh, she's very knowledgeable. Uh, she's played against some of the best shooters in the world, so obviously that's benefit of, to me because she t gives me tips on like what I need to do to be a better player and step up to that level. Um, now you are the tallest player in the ANZ competition, standing at 1 metre 96. Do you feel like that gave you an advantage in the circle throughout the season? It's definitely an advantage being so tall, but um, you also need to be strong. Like Just because you're tall, if you weren't strong enough, then you can just get pushed around. So yeah, there's a lot of factors that come into play with my game. Um, and as a child, who was your inspiration on the netball court? Well, I didn't watch a hell of a lot of netball, so. but um, Irene Van Dyke would definitely be, you know, the inspiration. She was the tall goal shooter at the end of the court, and that's what I was when I was young too. And one word um, which you describe as the tactics. Um, oh, that's a tough question. Uh, I guess I don't know. Vi oh, we just have good vibes in the team, really. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ellie, for joining us. Back to you guys. Thanks Natasha. Some bad news for those with KiwiSaver. Correcting a problem in its system, Inland Revenue has discovered 450,000 people haven't paid enough tax and will have to pay the difference, in some cases hundreds of dollars. But there is good news. Some have been overpaid and get a refund. Coming up, we check out a group discussing Christchurch issues. And are these New Zealand's future leaders? My name is Nan Surasampan. I work in the camera department in film and television. Currently I'm in Brussels uh, shooting a little piece, but I'm based in London and I travel all over the world filming bits and pieces here and there. Graduated four years ago from the New Zealand Broadcasting School. From then I've just been all over the place working on documentaries, commercials, TV series, reality shows, all sorts of stuff. After doing my internship with a local company in Christchurch, I moved over to New York. From New York, I went over to Vancouver. From Vancouver, I moved over to London. Working in Europe is amazing. The history that surrounds you, it's older than the country that I grew up in, and to me, that's very inspiring. 
The course was very practical, which was exactly what I needed. To do what I do, you need to really have your hands on the equipment to kind of feel where things need to be and how to frame and everything. The past four years after graduating from broadcasting school have been the best years of my life. Not many people can say, I do what I love as a living. I can safely say that. Every day I go to work, there's something new that I learn. It's very exciting for me. Welcome back. If you feel no one's listening to you, this might be the solution. Every Tuesday, Christchurch residents are invited to a central city pub for the Tuesday Club. As Victoria Harwood reports, it's an open forum to discuss local issues. Smash Palace is buzzing with something more than alcohol tonight. We throw ideas around and feed back to the politicians of the city and the country. It's a cold rainy night, but Smash Palace is full to the brim for the Tuesday Club, run by former Mayor Gary Moore. There's people here who, who have been involved in demonstrations and challenging things all their lives, and, and they welcome the chance. The forum usually draws between 50 to 70 people each meeting, and it's a tight fit. Hang on, there's a seat here. It's been a regular on the weekly calendar for almost four years now, created out of frustration at local politicians. Because we were sick of Jerry Brownlee telling us what to think, so we thought, up you Jerry Brownlee, we'll do something about it. Every week kicks off with a speaker, then the discussion is open to the audience. It recreates an older pub style discussion and aims to create transparency in the city. This week's speaker is community activist Patrick O'Connor, speaking about cultural diversity. Culture is what holds a community together, giving a common framework of meaning. This event provides an opportunity for people to come down and discuss issues that are important to them. It's on every Tuesday, so come down, grab a beer and have a yarn. I'd like to see the future of Christchurch where we actually say we're a 21st or 22nd century city and we're getting on with it. And the ideas for that future? Coming from an old style pub discussion. Victoria Harwood, Metro News. As New Zealand's population grows, so does the diversity in its people. The Pacifica community is pushing the younger generation and their leadership so they're better reflected in society. Isabel Prasad reports. Celebrating a busy past few months with some bacon, eggs and pride. After setting up a student vigil following March 15, Okirano Tilaya says his leadership is a reflection of Christchurch youth. As you know, this is who we are as young people in Christchurch. We're so resilient, um, we all want to help in some way. And I just saw myself as someone who bridges that gap, you know, giving them a platform to help out. Okia Pacifica and being head boy of Kashmir High is a chance for him to show he's more brain than brawn. He's a part of an emerging leaders breakfast that honours Pacifica in a nation which they at times struggle to fit into. By having a sense of belonging you've, you're more likely to succeed in the system and it is with the past history with New Zealand and um, the Pacific Island it is pretty complex. But it reaches higher than just school. Lack of representation in leadership roles is an issue the community hopes will be addressed in the upcoming council elections. It's important and once you relate to the people that's where everything will kind of just work itself out. At the moment, no Pacifica people are on the Christchurch City Council, but with the local body elections being held in October, there's plenty of opportunity coming up. If we are to go forward and to think about our future, um, and it's their future, not ours, we have to be listening to them and their ideas. The students feel it's time they have their voices heard. That young people do have a voice and that we are, you know, change makers. But until then, they say there's nothing holding them back from leaving their mark in the sand. Timmy Aplin Barrett is here with the weather. Timmy, is the cold weather letting up at all? Actually, Isabel, it just might be. Christchurch did wake up to a frost, but hopefully the nights won't be so cold for another couple of days. Auckland and Wellington got quite wet and windy, while Dunedin was mostly fine. Now Christchurch, despite a fine and frosty start tomorrow, expects some showers in the afternoon. Now we're looking a smidge warmer with a high of 13 and a low of 4. Ashburton and Timaru, you've got fresh, clear skies in the morning. But remember the umbrella coming home, as afternoon showers look set to dampen things. Twizel, you're a touch colder, looking at snow down to 800 metres. 
Further north, you're our warmest areas. Hemner and Oxford, you've got some showers late in the day, but Kaikoura is staying dry, reaching a high of 15. So enjoy that while it lasts. Now we're looking a little soggy in the coming days, so remember the raincoat, wrap up warm and drive safe. And with all this damp and chilly weather, snow lovers will be delighted to know that Mount Hutt opens on Friday. So Harry and Isabel could be a great weekend up in the mountain. Definitely, thanks Timmy. And finally, messages of love and support for Christchurch's Muslim community have been immortalised. The Give a Little page set up by Victim Support was flooded with comments. So to make sure they weren't lost, they've dedicated a new page on the website. The project, called In Our Words, is hoped to bring some comfort and light to one of New Zealand's darkest days. And that's all for Metro News tonight. For those stories and more, head to our website, metronews.co.nz, or you can find us on Facebook and Instagram. Join us again tomorrow night at 7. I'm Isabel Prasad. And I'm Harry Poland. Ka kite anō. Ka